of the mantras of the worship wars of the last 20 to 30 years has been that hymns aren't choruses and choruses aren't hymns. Well, is that really so? I've been doing a study on the most republished evangelical hymns in America up to the American Civil War and the most reused uh, contemporary worship songs since CCLI started reporting their data in 1989. And what I find is that when I compare the most republished evangelical hymns and the most used evangelical worship courses, there's actually quite a bit of overlap. And it's not necessarily in a good direction. For instance, if you take a look at both bodies of songs, uh, God the Father, explicitly by that name, and the Holy Spirit are very marginalized in both bodies of song. You get a lot of generic God and Lord and King references in both the older hymnody and in the contemporary worship songs, but you get very few explicit references to God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Complicating that is, and I've taken a close look at this, the sort of actions or verbs given to either God the Father or the Holy Spirit. It's quite amazing, contrary to the way the New Testament speaks, God the Father and the Holy Spirit are fairly marginal and fairly passive in the content of both bodies of song. I mean, that's quite astounding if you think about it. You can start Matthew through Revelation, and it's quite clear that the primary actor in the New Testament is God the Father, who acts through His Son, Jesus Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. But that sort of gang tackling of the problem of sin and evil is largely lost in both bodies of song. Well, so if the Father is marginalized and the Spirit is marginalized, who gets all the attention in both bodies of song? Well, you can obviously guess it, is Jesus Christ. In almost half the songs in both bodies of song, Jesus Christ is explicitly mentioned. And quite often, He becomes the main object of worship too. I think that's actually out of sync with both the grand history of Christian worship and with the New Testament itself, in which God the Father is the main recipient of worship, not Jesus Christ. That sometimes has me thinking that the whole kind of classic definition of worship has begun to dissolve, in which Jesus Christ's role is as the unique mediator between us and God, us and God the Father. I've now begun to think, time to time, and I'm trying to be a little provocative here, that with Jesus Christ as the main object of worship, we're having to find, like the people in the Middle Ages, a new mediator. They look to Mary and the saints, and I'm beginning to wonder if we're not looking to music and to musicians to be the new mediator between us and the divine object of our worship and adoration. So, okay, so those are some of the similarities of the marginalization of God the Father and the Holy Spirit. I mean, just a wild guess. How many contemporary worship songs of the most used songs do you think explicitly name uh, God as Father? It's, I can fit the number of songs on two hands. Guess how many songs, for instance, explicitly give a positive action to the Holy Spirit in the most used contemporary worship songs? Well, two out of 108 that have ever appeared on a top 25 CCLI list. Now you're thinking, well, the hymns are so much better in that regard. Well, remember where I started. No, they're not. Jesus Christ uh, is single-handedly handling the problem of sin, evil, and salvation, and He single-handedly almost is the main object of worship in both bodies of song. Now that's not to say anything about the composers themselves. This is actually reflecting popular selection and usage uh, in churches, in congregations. So, um, where else might the two bodies of song differ? They also differ, for instance, in the sense of immediate encounter with God. The older hymnody differ from the contemporary worship songs in the fact that Pilgrim's Progress, that wonderful classic from the 17th century, that idea of the Christian life as a long pilgrimage of great difficulty is kind of the main narrative strand uh, in hymn after hymn after hymn. 
The contemporary worship song, on the other hand, to use the a more technical term, has a higher sense of realized eschatology, uh, where we kind of gain immediate access into the heavens uh, through intensity and passion. Uh, so how would you explain that difference? I, believe it or not, I think a lot of it comes down to the rise of modern medicine. Um, the folks 200 years ago, uh, every morning when they woke up, they did honestly, despite their age, did not know if they were going to be around that evening. And so that anxiety about life um, uh, made them think of life as a long, kind of difficult journey, at the very end of which uh, they get the payoff of crossing the river and getting to go into the heavenly city. If you think about it, the structure of the hymns themselves uh, reinforce that, and that the payoff line in a hymn comes at the very end. But for us nowadays, with the rise of modern medicine, even if I grew gravely ill while I was shooting this, uh, I, the EMTs would be here in a few minutes, and I would not expect to necessarily think that this would be my day. Uh, add a little bit of consumerism to that, and I kind of expect uh, immediate fulfillment in life and a rich and happy life right now. That basic sensibility, I think, does get carried over into the contemporary worship songs. Sometimes people ask me, well, which uh, body of song is best? I'll just tell you, I think that's a totally false question. Both can be used for good purposes, and both can be misused for bad purposes, to the glory or the detriment of the glory of God. Mm -hmm.